Hello everyone, my name is Pepsilk and welcome to Thoughts On. This is a series where I analyze games and give my opinions on them. Today, we'll be looking at The Ascent. The Ascent is a cyberpunk isometric ARPG twin stick shooter made by Neon Giant, a new studio and their very first game in the industry. I know, that's a lot to take in. At a time where competitive shooters and battle royales were the quote-unquote best games to play in 2021, the RPG genre wasn't getting any love so seeing a new one come out is always a blessing in disguise. The game was developed by a team of 12 people and released on PC and Xbox, with PlayStation following suit a few months after. It also appeared on the Xbox Game Pass at launch, garnering more attention from critics and gamers. I'm a sucker for the Cyberpunk universe and all of its creations, so I naturally decided to pick this one up and even though it's got some issues that I didn't like, it's still a blast to play through. So let's talk about it. If you enjoy the video, like and subscribe and notifications turned on for more gaming content. Oh, and one last thing before I start, I didn't play the Cyber Heist DLC nor did I play New Game Plus, so I won't be able to give an opinion on either of these. The Ascent takes place in a futuristic dystopian timeline where powerful mega corporations assign indents, also known as slaves, to fulfill and complete their contracts, which is basically a for life kind of scenario where they have to do all kinds of dangerous activities, all for the sake of keeping themselves alive and fed. The game starts off in the Velas Arcology and you start as a blank slate character who's working for one of these corporations known as the Ascent Group. However, the group suddenly collapses and the Arcology becomes a free-for-all match with corporations, syndicates and districts all fighting for a piece of control in the city and your job is to find out what caused the Ascent Group to fall in the first place. The story is surprisingly decent for an ARPG but not too much the way you'll care about it on Diablo levels but there's plenty of scenarios and cool things that you do like appropriating machines, which are basically horde defense levels and fighting bosses, one being this massive spider that spawns little spiders to fight for it. If you love this sort of conspiracy-like story, there's plenty of lore in the data pads that you find throughout the world that help detail more about Velus and the situations that unfold within it. I didn't care too much personally and more or less enjoyed the ascent for the gameplay, but it's not to say the story is all bad and you may get more invested into it than I did. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, Neon Giant, that you guys nailed the industrial cyberpunk setting perfectly. I'm not sure whether or not this game was made with a AAA budget or a AA budget, but regardless, this is easily the best looking isometric game I've ever seen. The rusted metals combined with the neon lighting signs, the clubs, the shops, the dirty sewers and the futuristic parts of the archaeology like the D-Nexus or the Pinnacle, there's just so much to look at and it looks great. The game uses fixed camera angles, so during certain parts such as elevators or a vantage point that when you go to it, it just zooms out for all to see. It's really fascinating how they were able to design each and every building in the game with Unreal Engine 4 and just nail it out of the park. For quick context, I'm using high graphical settings with ray tracing turned off to help gain better performance and even with it on or off, it still looks great. It's not common to see games with a small team like this nail it out of the park, Better yet, this industrial-like setting, since most cyberpunk games, both pen and paper and video game format, are more about the future parts of it than the industrial ones, such as Cyberpunk 2077. Interestingly enough, the game was inspired by the 2080 comics and the Robocop series, which highlights a lot of the industrial parts of their respective cyberpunk universes, and the team was so confident to preview more of their game just to prove that they weren't copying CD Projekt Red, given that during the time, they were the main talk when it came to cyberpunk in general. Having said that, I love every district and area that the game throws you in and deserves a big clap from me. Well done, Neon Giant. So, the gameplay, the main thing that everyone prioritizes when playing an ARPG. Is it good? I can confidently say yes, but with a few caveats. I'll start with the positives first. I tried playing the Ascent like a run and gun game where you just shoot enemies, you take damage and then rinse and repeat the whole way through, just with different weapons as you find more out in the world. But I kept dying over and over and over again and couldn't figure out why. Then I realized that the game isn't as much of a run and gun as you think. Early on in the game, the Ascent introduces you to a cover mechanic where taking cover will prevent you from taking damage while also being able to shoot back. This combined with another mechanic which lets you shoot high while holding right click, making enemies on higher ground more susceptible to your shots 
or can be used while on cover to shoot an enemy at the same level. Create a gameplay loop where scanning your surroundings before getting into a fight is important, even if you get into the fight too quickly most of the time. The enemies are also absolute lasers, so majority of the time they won't miss their shots. This is very important in the early game because you won't have the HP to sustain and keep yourself alive, so base tanking isn't the best strategy. I played the entire game on normal for anyone wondering, and yes, this game can be hard if you don't know what you're doing. It kind of reminds me of the old cover shooters like the Gears of War and Mass Effect series, just with that top-down camera. Shooting enemies while aiming high also adds additional stagger, allowing them to stumble and be stunned for a few seconds, saving yourself of the laser aim that they can have. There's plenty of weapons to use, from pistols to submachine guns, miniguns, sniper rifles, assault rifles, and more. The Ascent opts for a more traditional upgrade system as opposed to RNG like most ARPG games, which is done by heading to a gunsmith and upgrading their marks with components, up to a max of Mark 10. Components can only be found in the world through various things such as chests, quests, and bounties, which are these random events where a named enemy pops up while you're exploring the world. Upon killing them, they drop an item which you can assume is their head or a tag and can hand it into one of the bars in the Arcology, which will give you U creds. U creds is the currency of the Ascent and is used to buy items from many vendors, such as armor, weapons, equipment, and the Grafter, who are the ripper docs of the game and provide you with augmentations, modules, and a choice to respec and change your look. Augmentations are active items which are used like equipment and have cool little quirks, such as a falcon punch, Robots, which I both found useless and highly recommend to not use other than it being a temporary face tank, and micro missiles. Then you got modules, which are items that provide passive bonuses. I only ever ran two health modules because the other option I had just wasn't really worth it since I was trying to build myself into a face tank by the end of the game. And lastly, equipment or tacticals, which are your throwables, such as grenades and auto turrets. The highlight here for me was the pocket mech, which lets you pilot it so you can mow things down. It's so freaking satisfying. And that leads me to talk about builds now. I think the light RPG elements that this game has is really cool in concept that encourages you to make multiple characters, which I think was the main premise of this sort of game, since every ARPG is all about trying new things and seeing what sticks. In the Ascent, however, I think building isn't its greatest strength. Let me explain why. So in the game, there's eight skills to choose from, with every two skills applying to a specific attribute, which are cybernetics, motorics, biometrics, and frame, and these attributes help contribute towards your augmentations, which give a benefit based on how many you have. This is good because it allows you to build towards those attributes based on the augmentations that you're running, making them stronger and more effective. The problem I have here is that half the skills to choose from feel useless and not worth picking up, especially during the early game since I would argue is the hardest part of the ascent. The two main skills I prioritized were critical hit rate and vital signs, which Combined together, give me both more damage and more HP, enough to be able to sustain even the toughest of enemies. After that, I kind of just gauged off what I needed at the time and picked random ones, like aiming and weapon handling, thinking they'd make a huge difference when it didn't really do much. Having weapon spread recovery rate or weapon swap speed didn't feel as worth as having more damage and HP, and I don't think glass cannon builds would work either because of how much damage enemies can do in this game. You can argue that the reload speed is good for those who run heavy weapons, but that's about it. I would have loved to see aiming reduce spread instead of recovering it, so that way faster firing guns such as the SMGs or the minigun for instance can be more controllable down further distances. Tactical sense isn't too shabby, but unless you're spamming grenades or building into the pocket mech like I did later on, there isn't much reason to take that. Body battery is decent too as having more energy helps later on, but Balance and evasion don't seem too crazy unless you're planning to do a speedy McSpeed build or make yourself move as fast as a normal weapon whilst using heavy weapons. Stun and knockbacks are non-existent too since you're in cover the majority of the time. I barely got stunned or knocked. I just think some changes to this would have made the other options more meaningful early on instead of just contributing towards the end game. The other RNG part outside of weapons dropping is armor which is associated with rarities like other ARPGs. As I'm writing this, I realize that this game does what other games of this genre do too, which makes sense. I don't know, just felt like bringing this up because I'm yet to see it do something different. Rarities are different in this game, and in order it goes peach, bronze, silver, gold, and purple. I say different because these aren't your typical rarity colors. The higher you equip, the better stats you get. 
Armor gives you defenses to both physical and elemental damage while also boosting your attributes and skills. Scaling in the Ascent is fixed and not dynamic, so enemies don't scale with your level as you go through each area. So it's best to steer away from any enemy that is at least 5 levels higher than you. Some areas will have low or same level enemies in one part and high level enemies right next to it and I get a feeling this may have been a last minute thing that Neon Giant worked on prior to its release. I also believe that armor and weapon level contributes to your overall power, having a system like Destiny's where the higher rarity and mark you have on your weapons, the more powerful you'll be. I had an example where I was fighting the Mechazoid which is the giant spider I mentioned before and the first few times I fought him, he was way too strong and just kept melting me and I realized that I had low energy and digital resistance. So I equipped high rarity gear and just like that, the Mechazoid dropped two levels, including the little spiders that he spawns, making the boss fight significantly easier. I pretty much got it on the first go after that. It may have also been from leveling up prior to swapping out my gear as well. It's just that from the way I read the tutorial description of quality colors, where it says that if it's higher, it means it's scaling better with your attributes and skills. I thought that staying on the ones I had would be more beneficial since it was the ones I was looking for, but it didn't seem to be the case. So I stopped worrying about the bonuses and equipped whatever gave me more defenses for the rest of the game after that. I wouldn't say it's bad, it's just a bit hard to understand how things are scaled because there's definitely times in the game where you get owned for a while before eventually pushing through or equipping better gear to try and make them weaker. If you struggle throughout the game, there's the game's side quests which are more or less exploring the outer parts of the arcology and getting more bang for your buck. Some provide some interesting storylines like sabotaging a race so that he can win and get the money he needs to pay this guy back while most are just there for filler. You can also find more gear this way too. Some of the side quests as well have an area that you need to go to but the game doesn't tell you that you're locked out of that area, making you think that the game may be bugged or simply doesn't want you to progress. But what's actually happening is that you need to go there during the main quest before you can access it, which can be very annoying at times, especially if you want to get the side quest over and done with. Kind of drags it out a bit. I forgot to mention there's a light character creator which doesn't do much other than affect your looks but hey, it's neat and cool. You can fast travel via train or taxi with trains being free and taxis requiring a thousand U creds per trip which can be very pricey early on. There's also the game Cyberdeck which lets you hack doors, chests, ATMs, turrets and other miscellaneous machines such as health and energy machines. There's a maximum of 10 Cyberdeck levels and each level helps to increase a certain part of the Cyberdeck which you can check in your character's menu and it increases the ice level. So you start off at an ice level of one for chess and as you go up, and, and, or, and doors as well, and as you go up, you'll increase the ice level and unlock new things that you can hack as well. So you won't be able to hack uh, turrets and miscellaneous machines until you get to a specific cyber deck level, but it just helps to kind of encourage exp exploration a bit because there are some areas that are locked off and being able to hack these will give you access to new gear as well. And it's really handy. The Ascent ran like absolute butter for me, going 100 plus FPS in almost all the areas on my RTX 3080 with a Ryzen 5 3600 processor on high settings with no ray tracing. There were times where the game would occasionally drop under this number but that's due to the amount of particles and effects going on at once so it's understandable. Combined with DLSS quality mode, you're in for a beautiful looking game. I only had one crash to desktop upon loading into a new area but nothing that made me turn away from the game. Though I may have given the Ascent a bit of praise, there's a good amount of problems that I have with it. You can actually brick yourself from playing the game by attempting to fast travel as soon as you load up, which will give you an error saying that you failed to connect to the game. And then you can't move or press any buttons. The only way to resolve this is by old f 4 which is a bloody pain in the ass and I'm surprised this hasn't been fixed. I also have some issues with the UI, like not having hover tooltips. I don't like having to press a key bind or memorize the icons when I can simply hover over them to learn what's what. As a new player, it'll get annoying at first but this issue will eventually go away after a while if you stick with it. The map is horrible to use as it's very hard to see things and you can't rotate the map around either. You also can't put waypoints down, meaning you have to rely on your sense of direction or the objective marker button when you're tracking a quest. I played this game on mouse and keyboard and two years after its release, they still have the LB and RB icons on the top left and right of the menus. Nice. Nice. While the soundtrack is amazing for the most part, composed by the GOAT himself, Paul Blashtak, sorry if I butchered that, who worked on the Witcher and Dying Life soundtracks, whoever worked on the sound mixing didn't do a good job of mixing and mastering it all together.
during certain attack sequences, the OST is loud and good, but everything else sounds quiet. I watched Skillup's video and he mentioned sound mixing being bad too. Two years this has existed and no one has bothered to fix this? Upon completing a main quest, you have to exit out of the zone before getting the next main quest, which at times can be easily done with a taxi if it's allowed, but other times you have to remember your way out. So unless you remember where you came from or have a side quest on, you may have trouble finding your way. Just give the damn quest as soon as the mission is completed. Enemy spawns are completely random, which is fair given these types of games and what they go for. However, it annoyed me the most when I was having trouble in a mission where I had to defend the AGI cognitive core while it's turning on and the first two times I did it, I was getting the usual melee in ranged enemies. It was clear that I was a bit underleveled for this, but I had to do it anyway because it was a point of no return area. The third time I did it, the hacker enemy spawned and fucking decimated me. If you're going to do random spawns, at least spawn these enemies the first time instead of relying on RNG to decide on who spawns and who doesn't. Despite its flaws, The Ascent is still a damn good game, offering up a good few hours of fun and enjoyment. You can also play with two friends, so if you have two buddies, fire it up. It's got plenty of variety, beautifully designed areas, and the tacticalness of it all makes it a standout amongst its peers, even if the light RPG elements don't tickle your fancy. It's a play once then move on sort of game. I highly recommend that you buy this game on sale, which it does go on very often, and if you crave more of the game, get the Cyber Heist DLC. I don't see myself replaying the game on New Game Plus or with the DLC because of the problems I mentioned, but a one-time experience is definitely worth it. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. If I missed anything, comment down below. I'll have more coming to you soon. Peace.